countries such as the RSC, the National, the OVIC and Complicité. He spent 10 years actually as artistic director of the lyric theatre Hammersmith. But Neil is also a novelist and his must-read recently published book, The Disappearance Boy, um, is um, a story that's set backstage in Brighton um, um, and it re re revolves around a, a variety theatre in the 1950s. So Louise Young's letter to an unknown soldier appears at the back of the small wonder brochure, which many of you must already have re seen and read, and if not, is uh, lying around. But her other claim to fame is that she's the best-selling novelist, um, and her novel set in World War I, My Dear, I, My Dear, I Wanted to Tell You, um, is sort of very relevant to the project, um, as well as the sequel, which was published this year, The Hero's Welcome. Uh, so just before handing over to Neil and Louisa, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this session, Rathfinney, which are one of our highlight sponsors, and one of our partners, and we're very, um, uh, we're very happy to welcome some, some of their party here this afternoon. So I'm going to hand over to Neil and to Louisa. Thank you very much. Um, if I wander off microphone and you can't hear me, then please shout, I can't hear you at any point. Um, so both Louisa and I, in different ways, are connected to writing about, thinking about, imagining, reimagining the First World War. Uh, the material that we're going to be reading this morning is from one extraordinary source. Um, this face that you see looming behind me is the face of a war memorial by a sculptor called Charles Sergeant Jagger, and it stands on platform one of uh, Paddington Station in London. And if you've never encountered this great work of art, I suggest next time you're catching a train in Paddington, leave yourself time to pop over to platform one. Earlier this year, or in fact at the end of last year, I was invited to submit a proposal for an artwork as to be part of this year's commemoration of the centenary of the First World War. I've always loved this statue, not only for this beautiful face, but for the fact the man has that particular expression on his face because he's portrayed doing a very familiar but also rather strange thing. He's in full trench uniform, as so often those figures are on a war memorial, but he's reading a letter. He's torn open the envelope. You can see its jagged edges. And as you can see, the expression on his face as he reads the letter is curiously inscrutable. Of course, we have no idea who that letter is from or what message it contains. And my proposal for an artwork to commemorate the centenary of the outbreak of the war this year on the 4th of August was to invite everyone in the country to write that letter. Instead of thinking, oh, I wonder who that letter's from, I wanted people to ask themselves the question, well, if it was from me, what would I say? And with my fantastic producer, Angela McSherry, who's here this morning with her friend Jean, we set about creating how could everyone write to the soldier. Um, we created a website where people could send their letters, but also a lot of people decided to actually send them through the post uh, to the soldier at the station. The project ran for 37 days, the famous 37 days, that run from the 28th of June, which was when the family of uh, Archduke Ferdinand were assassinated in that infamous one-way street in Sarajevo, through to 11 o'clock on the 4th of the August, which was when the then Prime Minister Asquith announced to the House of Commons that this country had joined the war. The 37 days in which um, the war became as we are told, inevitable. And in those 37 days this year, you could send 
your letter to the soldier. And we created as many systems of talking about the project as we could, online, on the radio, on television, in the press, and by writing to prisons, women's institutes, trade unions, schools, colleges, universities, writing groups. And I remember at the end of the first day, no, the second day we were thrilled because we'd had a hundred letters and we thought that was extraordinary. By 11 o'clock on the 4th of August, the soldier had received 21,439 letters and they came from all sorts of people. They were every kind of story that you could imagine. Some are two lines long, some are much longer. They all still exist, of course. The website that contains all of those letters is still online. If you Google letter to an unknown soldier, you will find this photograph and lurking behind it are all 21,439 of those letters. Um, they're going to stay there until 2018 and then they're entering the collection of the British Library. If anyone in another 100 years wants to know what we as a country were thinking about remembrance, then they could do a lot worse than look at those thousands of voices. What Louisa and I are going to do this morning is um, read some of our favourites. And I'm going to read one favourite in particular. We, through the Small Wonderful Festival, we invited uh, people to contribute their pieces of writing, their letters to the soldier. And through that route of invitation, a bunch of letters came in and I've, I've picked the one that I really like and I'm going to read that this morning. Um, so we're going to read letters for a bit and of course talk about them, what they make us feel and a bit about where they've come from. And then there'll be time for questions about what we've read afterwards. So Louisa, I know you've, you're no stranger to the First World War. Could you just tell us, before I say to you, go on, read us a letter, read one that you've caught your eye out of so many letters on the website, just to, to give us a bit of a context. I know that you've lived in this world a bit before of trying to literally the act of remembering something that of course none of us can remember. How do you, how do you go about remembering, recreating, reimagining it's a very good word, remember, isn't it? Yeah. I, uh, in the course of writing that one, which is largely about surgery, I, uh, I was looking into the word remember, and of course it is actually putting the members back together, to remember, remember, literally. Um, and of course putting things back together that you haven't experienced is always going to be a bit of a trouble but you know i'm a novelist i make it up yeah. but at the same time i do what everybody seems to be doing in these letters which is <coughs> dredging their ghosts you know i can't see how old you are out there but i think you're a variety of ages but everyone here will have had some ancestor a parent a grandparent a great grandparent who left something behind on the Western Front or in North Africa or at Gallipoli. Uh, my grandfather left his arm behind. Right. And weirdly, this year, we finally, uh, we'd never thought about it, but of course, when you lose your arm, you also lose your sleeve. Somebody was watching the Antiques Roadshow and there was a lady there during one of the World War I specials holding up some gold braid that her father had been given at the Battle of Zeebrugge while assisting an officer to have his arm amputated and it became apparent that this was the braid from my grandfather's sleeve so I went to see her tracked her down went to see her in Cardiff and there she was Phyllis aged 90 something and uh, she said that it had been her life's ambition to give this braid back to the family of the officer who'd had his arm removed and so we just sat in the stroke unit of Cardiff Hospital weeping over a little bit of gold braid. So putting things back together, yeah, for me it's been very largely family memories and when I read my story, which I'm afraid I'm going to, um, everything in it is true and you will see some of how a girl would get inspired to write a novel about 
love and death and maxillofacial reconstructive surgery in World War One. But yeah. I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to start with the, one of the funniest and sweetest letters. Shall I read it now? Please do. Okay. This one is by Ryan Callahan of London. Dear Dad, I hope you come back alive instead of dead because I would have no chance surviving in the front line, but I know you would because of your bravery and strength. If you do happen to die, I will remember you with all my heart and I will tell everyone how brave you were. Please can you try not to die so the fun can go on. So just remember I am supporting you even when you're in a tough situation. When you come home, if you survive, there will be a huge surprise and I promise it will be fun. Even though you're in the front line, I know you can do it. The only three things are that I ask. Number one, send me a letter every week. Number two, try not to die. And number three, win the war. I know, I know I have been putting you off, but here's the fun part. If you come back, mum is going to take you to a famous nightclub and wants to kiss you. All right? Love, your son, Ryan. P.S. Don't tell mum about the nightclub. <laughs> uh, how fantastic to hear a voice that clean and that fresh in response to that brooding bronze face. I'm going to read a very different letter. Um, I wonder how long it will take for you to realize whose voice this is. Uh, dear sir, you are one soldier. It's rather long, I might not get to the end. You are one soldier, but you stand for millions, for the millions of young British men who have fought to defend our freedoms, for the millions of us left behind who will be forever in debt to the extraordinary service and sacrifice of your generation. When you left our shores, you did so with hope and purpose, posing proudly in your uniform, you had a sense of mission and perhaps even of adventure. You knew that you were volunteering to help your country to fight a just cause. You did so eagerly with honour. Any guesses so far? Today, as you read this letter, you know better than we can ever imagine the monumental horror and suffering of this war. After what you have seen, no one would blame you for asking why. No one would criticize you for feeling angry, sad, or afraid. Barely any family in our country has escaped unaffected. But be in no doubt, soldier. However dark this time of war, our world would have been far darker if you had declined the call to act. Without your service, our security, our values, and our very way of life, would have been lost. Historians will trace back to your sacrifice some of the world's greatest advances, from the development of medicine that can heal wounds and sickness to the emancipation of women and the advance of civil rights for ethnic minorities. And there's another whole page. Um, all sorts of extraordinary people wrote to the soldier and that one is from David Cameron. Um, um, it caused consternation in the office when we received it. Uh, we were told it was coming. It is an extraordinary example of how the language that was invented in 1915, really, of um, the idea of sacrifice, the idea of a just war, and the idea of a heroic definition of this country have not just fossilized over the years but are being urgently brought back into service. Uh, they emerged uh, last night in extraordinary circumstances in the House of Commons. I have to say that bit about that the soldiers in the First World War somehow knew they were fighting for the emancipation of women and the advance of civil rights for ethnic minorities is one of the most odious pieces of claptrap that <laughs> appear anyway in all 22,000 of the letters. I'd like to follow David with a corrective voice 
just to cleanse the circumstances of our reading. This is another letter from a school child. This is Shane, who's 14. I think he gets more done in his one paragraph than David gets done in his two and a half pages. Dear Unknown Soldier, well, imagine you could read my letter now and you'll see how far the world has come since you were fighting in that war. You may have been unknown then, but not now, because you've got millions of people writing you letters, and most of them are expressing their feelings and say how much of a good person you really are. If I could meet you now, there would be so many questions I'd like to ask you, but for now, here are just three. Number one, what was your family like? Number two, what did you like to do? Number three, who were you fighting for? Fantastic. It was an amazing experience to be going into the office every day and we had a team of readers sifting the letters as they came through, 10 young people from the University of Bath and every day they would uh, bring the best letters, the best 100 or 200 or 300 letters from that day uh, to the table and we sit in the office and on screen read them and it was extraordinary to hear sometimes you know two letters like that would come next to each other and we began to realize that what we'd done in the middle of a year which is crowded with official ceremonies and commemorations um, we'd created a space which in which people could just talk as themselves we never said anywhere how you should write or why you should write and as you'll hear people made all sorts of different choices uh, how to express themselves and indeed what to express louisa pick another shall i pick one at random i might do he doesn't know what he's reading let's see let's see it's a letter From. unfold it this is a good one this is, um, this is from a historian, Margaret Macmillan. Dear unknown soldier, if only I could talk to you rather than writing a letter, but then what would we say if we were face to face? You would surely find me strange, an old woman by your lights and one who is wearing trousers and doing what you would see as a man's job. Worse, I fear that you would find me obtuse, tactless and insensitive. I want to ask you so many questions, but would you want to answer them? Soldiers in your war, and I suspect that it is true of most, find civilians intensely irritating with their talk of glory and heroism, their unwillingness to accept that war is so often boring, dull and mindless when it is not about killing or being killed. Civilians are full of hate for the enemy. I suspect you are more likely to feel sympathy for those soldiers across no man's land. Those poor sods, I can imagine you saying, they're caught up in the same mess. Let me start with an easy question. Who are you when you're not a soldier? Where do you come from? From remote farms in the Welsh hills, perhaps, or in deepest Cornwall? Is the war the first time you've been in a city or seen a big railway terminus like Paddington? Or are you a clerk from a city office, snatched from your comfortable routine of train in, train out, rain and shine? When you go home, what is it like? I so wish I could place you. Is it a farmhouse kitchen, a pretty house in the suburbs, or a London flat? Can we talk about class? Do you have a rich father, a university education? Unlikely, I suppose, given that the upper classes are such a small section of society. It's more likely that you're from the middle or working classes. There's so many more now. Perhaps you belong to a union. They've been getting quite militant lately, haven't they? I can't help but be more personal still. You look very young to me. Have you been in love? Oh, please tell me that you have. You're reading a letter. Let it be from someone you love and who loves you. I do so hope that you and your loved one, girl or boy, we don't care so much about that these days, have had time to throw yourself into each other's arms. OK, I'll stop there because I suspect that I'm making you blush. But I have to tell you that it is so unfair if you have been swept from the earth without enjoying some of the pleasures of being human. War isn't fair, of course. I scarcely need to tell you that. And we rely on the young, like you, to fight them. Old people do not make good soldiers. The young do because they are full of energy and readier to be brave and reckless. You went off hoping you would come back. 
forgive me for being blunt, but you haven't, nor have millions of others. Whether it was worth it, I will leave to others to decide. I just wish we could talk about it all. Yours affectionately, Margaret. P.S. I don't want to call you unknown anymore. One of the choices that people had to make, of course, was who was this soldier they were writing to. Um, quite often, Angela and I, um, and my co-creator on the project, novelist Kate Pullinger, we taught this project. We went into all sorts of organisations, schools, colleges, universities, reading groups, to encourage people to write their letters. And the simplest way I found of doing it was to say, how does a letter begin? And according to the age group of who I was talking to, the answer was either immediate or if we younger people who don't write letters, um, they had to search for it. And of course, the first word of any letter is dear. And I would go, great, we've started our letter, get that up on the whiteboard. What is the next word? And in that choice, you decide almost everything about your letter because does he have a name? Is it the name of someone you're making up? Is it the name of perhaps someone in your family? Um, you talked about your grandfather and his arm. My grandfather uh, left a large part of his lungs in France. Um, is it, or are you writing to a statue? Are you writing to a symbol? Are you writing to an idea? Um, people made all of these different choices. Uh, my next letter that I want to read is someone who chose a name as the second word. <coughs> Dear Jack, I know we're not on speaking terms anymore, but I've been thinking, what if you die? I've been finding it hard to forgive you, and it's worse because I'm the only one who thinks you've done anything wrong. Your family and mine certainly don't. It was hard to bear the white feathers, and especially getting one from Ellen. Now, don't flap your hand at me. I know you like her. So do I, of course, but you're the hero now. You'll still say it wasn't the feathers. You just saw the light. And maybe you're right. Maybe it is sometimes not wrong to kill people. Maybe this war is a glorious exception. And no, I can't think that or only for a short time about four o'clock in the morning. I hope in a way you're still as determined as the day you got on the train and don't have doubts at night to suffer as well as all the other things over there. When it's over, we can argue about all of this in the pub. I keep wanting to say, how could you? How could you leave me? And trying to stop myself. I want you to regret this bitterly. I'm sorry. Will I send this letter? It helps writing it anyway. If I go to prison, they might not let me write to you, so I will send it. I expect your mother will send socks and chocolate. Ellen too. So this is just from your friend, still, Edward. That letter's by Carol Churchill. Um, it's extraordinary how in just one short page, she absolutely makes you feel you have a window into a whole story of Jack and his friend, Edward. Edward, who's clearly a conscientious objector and is dreading going to prison. A significant number of people, when they wrote letters, chose to tell, it was a chance to tell stories that they felt hadn't been told. For Carol, clearly it was important to tell the story of the, a conscientious objector, a group of people that we still don't hear much about. I mean, lots of people have a, a vague awareness that this place was very much connected to that tradition. Um, Lytton Strachey, I mean, I don't know the full story, but certainly Strachey and David Garnett and Grant were all conscientious objectors. But it's one thing to know that fact. It's another thing to hear somebody's voice, the, the panic, the fear, the dismay, the being cut off. Um, and I, I 
can relate to that very much again this morning, hearing the reports of the debate in the House last night. You don't go, well, what if I disagree? Where does that leave me? Where do I have to turn if I want to withdraw my consent? And I think that letter gives an extraordinary window into those feelings. Louisa, your turn. This is, uh, this is by Anonymous, age 42, from Gateshead, veteran. Friend, how did you feel leaving your loved ones knowing you might never return? I cried for hours after leaving them at the airport, thinking I may never see them again and feeling very selfish for putting them in that position. It was my choice to join the military and now it could change the future for my family. Was I selfish? Do you have a list of things to do before you were drafted in case you didn't come back? I chose fishing and bingo. I didn't really like either. Did you have fab friends? I did. Without them, who knows? Did your family understand that being there changed you? Mine don't, and how can I expect them to? I protected them from what was really happening over there. They don't want to know the scary stuff. Did you cry when you were on your own? I do. Not just for those who've been killed, but for those who suffer every day because of the unseen effects of fighting. Did you ever tell anyone how you felt? I haven't until today. Thanks for listening. Kiss, kiss, kiss. It's interesting that I remember that one coming in, that sting in the tail of saying, I've never told anyone what I think about this until t today. I Part of the family story that I was handed down as a, I never knew my grandfather. He died eventually. It took him a very long time to die from the injuries to his lungs, which he got from being gassed in France. Um, he died when I was two, so I never knew him. But various bits and stories come down, they get reiterated mm. in the family. And one of them, which we heard again and again and again, I don't know if any of you have this in your family history, that the story is that people didn't talk about what had happened. I See, see you, that title? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the letter that that title comes from. Tell us. Okay. So, if you've been wounded, and you're in the casualty clearing station or wherever, and facial injuries obviously were very prevalent in the first war. Trench warfare, your body is more protected than your head, especially as you didn't get a helmet until sometime in 1915. So you've been wounded, you're sitting there. If you wanted to write home to tell them what happened, the letter would have to go through censors and it would take forever. So they give you a postcard, which you can fill in, printed postcard. And the postcard reads, my dear, blank, so whoever you're sending it to. I wanted to tell you before any telegram arrives that I have received a slight, severe, delete as applicable, wound in my, let me fill it in. And this is precisely where this novel originated because if you look at the photographs of particularly the men who've had facial injuries and you look at that postcard and you think, well, there he is, 19, covered in mud and blood. Dear mum, I have received a serious wound in my face. Mm. I don't think so, really, do you? Yeah. So, dear mum, I have received a slight wound in my stiff upper lip and everything is going to be fine. So I nicked that title from that postcard. Of course, when you see it out of context, it looks a bit Mills and Boone, but um, it is related to precisely that thing that everybody knows. You know, Grandpa never talked about the war. Yeah. And I, one of the things that I still can't resolve in my head is um, why is it that our national form of resemblance of remembrance is a silence we get together and shut up um, once a year and I discovered that the origin of the two minute silence at the cenotaph was um, government officials on the first anniversary were convinced that there would be public disorder, that people would at the very least become hysterical because the casualties were had been so monumental um, uh, by the end of the war. And 
someone somewhere, and I've never had time to do the finding out. I'm sure there's a historian's account somewhere, and someone might know of it. Someone somewhere had the brilliant idea, the one thing we can do together is be silent. And I, I, I still have extraordinary ambivalent feelings about that, especially since I've been involved in reading and collecting and editing all of these voices. Is silence um, the most appropriate response to the anniversary? It's an understandable one, but is it the right one? An extraordinary thing happened um, last Remembrance Sunday in Brighton. Um, the the silence is instigated by the firing of a cannon, a small cannon that they trundle out every year. And there had been a storm the night before and the roofs of the town were covered with roosting seagulls who come in off the beach and into the town when there's a storm because it's safe to, safer to be off the stones. And of course, as the cannon was fired and the whole town felt silent, the sky was filled with a thousand seagulls who screamed for two minutes. And it was one of the most unearthly and upsetting experiences because just for a moment you didn't know what the screaming was. And I wondered. Uh, That's astounding. Yes, it was, it was truly uncanny. I do maddeningly know who invented the Please silence. Tell us. And it was a novelist, and I can't remember who, but it was somebody. I can't remember, but it was a novelist. It was the first public participatory commemorative artwork, in fact. Oh. You will recognize this face, Angela. This is the, oh God, so much death. And How about, can I read? I think this is, <laughs> I like this one. This one, I don't know why. This one strengthens me and cheers me up. Can I read this one next, yes. Louisa? Then you go. Right. Um, this is from Rob, who's 50 and comes from North Shields. Dear John, I'm enclosing a piece of twine. I cut it when I tied the tomatoes this afternoon. I used the knife you brought me. I really felt the weight of it is the thing of beauty. Jack Barnes popped his head over the fence and gave me some canes, which was kind of him. There was really no need. I think he feels guilty. He shouldn't. I wish I could send you the smell from pinching out the side shoots. So, John, anyway... I'm sending you a piece of string. Please tie it to something to remind you of home. I don't know if you'll be allowed to put it on your uniform. I thought you might tie it to a button, something you'd see and use every day. If that's not allowed, perhaps you could add it to your boot lace. When you see it, I want it to remind you to come home before the toms ripen. Come home, I'm sorry, I've gone now. We said this might happen, and Louis is going to rescue me by continuing. Yeah, right, where we're before the toms ripen. And let's hope we have a bumper crop. We could eat them straight off the plant and let the seeds burst all over our shirts, and we could have a laugh and not give a damn. We wouldn't worry about it. Ma could come down the garden path to see what all the hoo-ha was, and we could pick some more and laugh again. It would be good to hear Ma joining in with some laughter. I keep hearing the brass band like they played when you went off, John. I keep hearing them, but they stopped playing months ago. So here's a piece of string, John, and I'd like you to bring it home. I need you to bring it home. It's not a ribbon, John. It's not a ribbon with a medal on the end. I don't want to see one of them. I just want to see you. It's just a piece of string, John. Your loving brother, Alf. Thanks for rescuing me. Thank you. Just a piece of string. Should we have another what domestic next? one? Yes. Okay, dear oh, Mortimer. Was that Robbie? Yeah, Roberta okay. Taylor. Dear Mortimer, I know I haven't written much, but it's not a bed of roses here either. 
<laughs> we are finding life very difficult with you and Bill being over there, to say the least. You didn't have to go, neither of you. Now there's more havoc. You are going to have to be the one to decide how to handle this. Bill's flurry, can you imagine, has been having it off with that lantern-jawed old git from the greengrocers. He has to be 60 if he's a day. The whole street is agog with it, you can imagine. She's denied it all, of course, but last Monday, old Mrs Clark came upon the pair of them suddenly. I won't say more than that. We can't send you anything at the moment, as we have F all ourselves at present. Still, you might be home soon, please God, because I can tell you, son, I can't take much more of all this. Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Rob, Robbie grew up in Poplar, just at the top of the Isle of Dogs, and it shows. Um, Read yours. Yeah, this, thank, this is the letter I wrote to the soldier. Handsome, you've done your job. The committee that commissioned you explained to the artist that a good war memorial should evoke three emotions, pride, sadness, and fondness. And he gave them just what they ordered. He raised you up, smoothed out your face, and spread your legs, making the women and boys go weak at the knees, the mothers sob, and the men push out their chests. Christ, you must be tired. So here's an idea. Take a break. Read this. Read it twice if you can be bothered, then screw it up, toss it aside, and come on down. And I beseech you, don't do it at some magical, mythical dream sequence midnight. Do it in the rush hour. Do it when the station's packed. Do it when nobody can believe their eyes. Clamber down when whistles are blowing and the hard-working commuters are swarming off their trains, desperate for home and a drink or two. Leave them screaming and slack-jawed and shitting in your wake, uselessly clicking shots on their phones as you trail wet bronze across platform one, slouching monstrously towards the tube to dismay them down there too. Let people gibber that the dead are roaming, that they're looking for someone to shaft. Let word spread of three new sensations, horror, fear, and shame. Do you think that would achieve anything? Well, you never know. Sleep well, Neil. Tip for tap, okay. would you read yours? <laughs> would you? Follow that now. Yes, I will read mine. But can I say about that, follow that? Yeah. Because lots of people have talked about that sensation of does someone else's, what someone else feels, somehow disqualify or lessen what I feel? And the great, one of the great things about this project is. Um, every single letter that the soldier received was published on the website. None of the letters were edited. Um, grammar, content, spelling, opinion, race, gender, sexuality, address, none of it mattered. You have something to say to the soldier, we will publish your letter to the world. And all the something about that everyone can speak. Mm. was really, really empowering. I, I, like everyone else, I got so used to the idea that we have to come up with some national opinion on these things. And actually to push all of that aside and say, it's a letter. Mm. It might take you, in Shane's case, mm -hmm. I'm sure Shane wrote his letter in three minutes and then sat there for the rest <laughs> of the lesson on his phone. <laughs> Um, David Cameron's letter, I know, took um, three days to write uh, because I got to meet the man who actually wrote it for him. <laughs> his, that was my next his, question. <laughs> his military advisor. 
um, some other people called me up and said, I'm trying to write, and I thought, it's a letter, it will be so easy, and now it's three weeks later and I still can't say what I mean. I said, just just write down what what can you say? It's it's only a letter. You're you're allowed, you're entitled. Louisa. My grandmother, who is married to the grandfather who left his arm at Zeebrugge, was a sculptor and made war memorials and knew Jagger. And everything in this letter is more or less about her and it's all true. My sister's a sculptor as well. I, I, I like sculpture. Dear man of bronze, who sat for you? A man who came back when so many stayed out there? Or one who grew old enough to look the part only after it was all over? Are you wearing your own uniform or someone else's? Did you see La Grande Illusion set in your war? The young actor wears the costume, wears as costume the uniform the director wore in reality. My grandmother was a bronze casting sculptor. In 1910, before all this, she made a portrait of a dead man, Charles Rolls, 32, aviator, motoring pioneer, and as it turned out, the first Englishman to die flying. The tail of his plane fell off. To make the sketch statuette, she had to fetch his clothes from his mother's house. It was horribly grim. She came away with his coat, trousers, leggings and cap with blood on it. Then she was in despair over who to put into them. The first she tried was called Hal Bailey. It was dreadful and she couldn't stand it. Then she got a footman in, but he looked too appalling. And she was scared it was her first commission for a public monument. He soon wanted an excuse to hurry away. At 5.30, Mr. Basil Bogg, a clerk in the Lord Chamberlain's office and a nice lad of 23, came to pose. He was splendid and once rigged up in Rolls's clothes looked quite like enough to be very useful. He stayed till 10.30 p.m. They worked by gaslight. Charles Rolls's parents wept when they saw the little statue. In 1915, she was working at a French hospital, widowed by then. Her husband had died in Antarctica. Unseasonal weather derailed his expedition to the South Pole. His body never came back either like so many a few years later. She went through the pockets of French Tommies, strung their clothes and boots together and labelled them for fumigation. So pathetic and characteristic were the contents of their poor pockets, oh so dirty, mud and blood and dust, and such a smell. Later she made plaster casts of the heads of men with facial injuries for the surgeons to design their new faces on. Meanwhile, her future husband was losing an arm at Zeebrugge. Recently, the braid from his sleeve was returned to us. We had never even thought about what happened to the sleeve. She didn't serve on the Western Front or at Gallipoli or win the MC, like Jagger did, who made you. She wasn't wounded or gassed, as you were. She made war memorials. Did you pose much? Perhaps you sat for her. Whose helmet and woolen scarf are you wearing? Did you remember your comrades and weep inside? Or were you resentful or relieved that you hadn't taken part? Did you feel that sitting for a sculptor isn't proper work for a man? Or were you honoured to do it? Was it cold in the studio where you stood in for every man who died? What's in the pockets of your coat? Love, Louisa. It's interesting how many people mentioned, you can just see it there, the soldier's scarf. Um, he is in full trench uniform, but he's wearing a scarf that's clearly hand knitted and lots of people speculated. So who knitted that scarf? Who s did they send it to him? Um, I said that we invited people to, one of the ways we reached out to people was through the small wonder. Uh, festival and people wrote lots of people wrote letters and I've chosen one that really struck me that uh, from that particular crop that I'd like to read this one is in the form of a poem and it's by Charles Anthony <clears throat> 
You never did come home to see your mother, sobbing quietly in a corner of the kitchen. She never had the chance to bathe your scrapes and bruises with disinfectant, as she had many times before. She never had the chance to draw the bullets from your flesh like pulling thorns. She never had the chance to unravel the barbed wire from your hands as she had when winding wool. As you lay shattered, your mother refreshed the poppies on her kitchen table. So I don't know where Charles is from or what moved him to write, he doesn't say, but I know he had a mother. Hmm. What do you reckon? One little, one more? I've got each? a tiny one. Okay. Let's, let's make that the last one. Okay, one it's a good one. one. And she says of it, uh, this is written by a 23-year-old anonymous from Lancaster, I thought about the boys I went to school with. Tom, who sat across from me in maths. Jake, who built little boats in the harbour at Topsham. Robert, who hid how bright he was. Harry, who could be cruel. James, who couldn't. Oscar, who had the sharpest wit. Andrew, who always looked out for Charlie. Charlie, who became a father. So thank you very much to, for listening to us read some of the letters to the soldier. Um, we said we would leave a little bit of time at the end for anyone to ask questions. So that time has come, either about particular letters that, letters that we've read or about we've both been involved in writing about the war. So ask us about that if you'd like, or indeed about any old thing. Um, I see someone doing that thing of there's a microphone to make it even more intimidating to ask a question, but don't be intimidated. Please feel free. Yeah. I think someone's just going to pass you a mic so the people at the back can hear. Or no, thank you, sir. So you, you went to schools and you've read us the letter from Shane. Yeah. Did you get any? Did you aim to get any response? And if so, what sort of response did you get from primary pupils? We we didn't set out to uh, get response from primary pupils. I have to say, my thought was, it it's probably not the right project from for that. But Angela, how many letters do you think we got in the end from primary school students? Mm, about a thousand. Yeah, about a thousand. What the primary school students said in their letters um, depended very much on their teachers. Some teachers had clearly said, this is what we say about war. We say, we're so sorry, thank you for your sacrifice with undying gratitude. And you would get a class, you'd get 30 letters like that with poppies drawn round the edge. And some teachers had done a better job and had said, say what you think. And then you got extraordinary voices like that first letter that Louisa chose, where you have a kid genuinely, imaginatively going, cutting straight to the quick and saying, well, if it was my dad, what would I think? Um, and those letters were a joy because they bring you back to what matters. Because, of course, every soldier that's out there is someone's dad. And there is a kid waiting. And those were fantastic to hear. And that really made me think we, we, we're doing something. So, yes, there was a large response. Um, and what was the youngest one that we got, Angela, would you say? Yeah, that was a, a drawing, Dear Soldier, and a drawing. And we had a lot of letters 
from people in their 80s. Um, a lot of grandmothers and great-grandmothers, some of them very surprising. Um, some very outspokenly, vehemently pacifist letters from older women saying, I don't care, I just want it to stop. I found those letters very shocking because I wasn't really expecting them. I don't know why, but I wasn't expecting to hear those sentiments from those voices. Did someone else have a question? <coughs> Just a quick yeah. one. When you met uh, Cameron's military advisor, yeah. were you confrontational? What sort of uh, response did you get from him? Um, or from her? From him. Um, I was charm itself and so was I. Um, it was the most peculiar occasion. We got invited to um, a garden party at Downing Street, Kate and I. Um, and it was to launch the government's official program of commemorations running through the next few years. And uh, Cameron, before he made his speech, he had a singer. Uh, I can't remember her name. She was young and blonde and wearing a pink, hot pink see-through lace mini dress and she sang keep the home fires burning and I thought this whole thing is ascending to a level of surrealism I'm going to I'm just going to evaporate with ludicrousness and then Cameron made basically made a speech like his letter but he's you know he didn't go to Eton for nothing. He can speech make till the cows come home. And then um, there was a, a very tall, distinguished, uh, very good looking middle-aged military man. And as one must do at garden parties, you say, hello, my name is Neil Butler. I'm doing this and who are you? And he said, well, I'm David Cameron's military advisor. I wrote his letter for him. I went, oh, great. Um, <laughs> And I asked him how long it had taken. He said, quite a long while. I said, why was that? And of course, at that point, the charm dried up. And he said, oh, well, it was, um, let's just say there were several things that needed some attention, which I thought was interesting. I mean, as one knows, every utterance is carefully, carefully combed over. But um, there are there are certain signature phrases that the government uses again and again when talking about commemoration. And the, the key one is just war. Um, this very important central item in sort of British national mythology that there's somehow a continuity that the, the perfect war was the Second World War because almost all of us can agree that that was a just war. And what we now have to do is persuade ourselves that every w other war is too. So the First World War is kind of like the Second World War, which is nonsense, whichever way you slice it. And that every, every British military operation, uh, they're all part of some wonderful khaki clad continuum. And we can think about them in the same way. Um, but it was a very, ex very extraordinary meeting. Um, and you see, you see the shutter come down at a certain point, which is obviously he wasn't going to dis... I, what I wanted to ask was, so what did he say and what did you change it to? But I knew I would never get an answer to that question. But somewhere um, there will be the drafts of Cameron's original letter um, and the rewrites. And I hope one day they will um, they will be made public. I'd like to read those. Um, did you have any moving um, non-British response to? I mean, non-British letters. German, yes, we did. We had we had German letters, we had French letters, Canadian letters, New Zealand letters, Brazil, China. Um, so, yes, we didn't deliberately uh, make the project international, 
because we had a staff of three and a half people mm -hmm. and so we couldn't set our sights on the world but because the project was a website and was on the internet and people started talking ab about it we did get letters from all sorts of places of course not surprisingly because it's not called a world war for nothing uh, the family webs of connection reach right around the world um, yes yes we we did we did get letters uh, from Germany um, some some of them put themselves as a British soldier and some wrote how strange this is to be looking at a British soldier. One of the interesting things, um, there were only a few from Germany. One of the interesting things that the project revealed, Germany doesn't commemorate the First World War. Um, they don't have what we have. They don't have statues everywhere. They don't have big public ceremonies going back a hundred years. It is a very particular British thing. We invented the unknown soldier. We invented the two-minute silence. We invented the cenotaph. We think everybody else does that stuff, but no, they don't. We had a fascinating letter from a student in New Zealand saying, I have never understood why we do this every year. I ne when I was at school, I never knew why they all made us stand up for attention and and think about the war for two minutes. I had no idea what they're talking about, but now I'm looking at your face and I'm trying to think about it. So yes, lots of different perspectives. If you go onto the website and use the search engine, Germany or German, then that will eventually lead you to letters that came from Germany. So yes, you can find them. If if what we've been reading has whetted your appetite, if you Google letter to an unknown soldier, they're all there. You can search in all different ways. If you love books more than websites, um, we're publishing an anthology of 150 of the letters. The book is just called Letter to an Unknown Soldier, and that's going to be published in about three weeks' time. Um, so th that will be around as well. Diana, is that one last question? The letters um, that were sent to the front, were they all opened and censored? Yes. Yes, the censorship went both ways. Um, there was a temporary post office built in Regent's Park, at the bottom end of Regent's Park, which was at the time the largest wooden structure in the world. And the the reading and redirecting of the letters was done exclusively by women. They were thought to be more sensitive in the handling of letters. And there was a particular crack troop of women whose job it was to make sure that a returned letter saying missing in action which was just scrawled on the back and the letter was sent that one of those wouldn't arrive before the official telegram and this was originally a, gr a small group of women um, 10 of them and then as the war progressed that particular unit of the post office had to be expanded until eventually there were o over 80 women just doing that one job of making sure that someone didn't get a member of the family didn't get a returned piece of mail before the telegram arrived there's also an extraordinary story of one letter uh, because obviously people were moving on all the various fronts all the time that one letter was redirected 240 times before it finally reached the person it was addressed to um, if you're interested in reading uh, original letters the place to go is the Imperial War Museum uh, and if you can't get to the actual museum their website has a fantastic collection of letters that were both sent to the front and from the front 
Diana's elegantly sending me thought waves saying <laughs> enough already. Thank you very much. We should stop there. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to thank Louise and Neil for an absolutely remarkable session. I, I've been so affected by it. it um, those letters are so poignant and so eloquent. But what really hit me is that we've had and will continue to have the greatest short story writers appearing on this platform, all of whom you know we, we venerate. But th those letters are such artless and such perfect short stories in their own right. Um, it, it, it was a masterclass on how to write short stories um so I, I i you know i think there's a lot of food for thought there um I, it, it did seem so appropriate for us to host this event because as neil mentioned the milieu in charleston was established as a haven um for artists um who were conscientious objectors um in the first world war although a lot of their friends were were fighting so it's it it did span the whole gamut i can't resist telling you and i hope louisa won't mind particularly for the younger people in the audience that the her own letter that she read um, she told us that her grandfather lost an arm and they've just recovered the braid for that arm but she referred to her grandmother's first husband who didn't return from the was it the arctic or the antarctic i'm <laughs> sorry i always forget that was actually captain scott um and um many people do think that his heroism um affected a lot of the soldiers who subsequently went to serve in the First World War. So I finally just like to thank Angela McSherry, who um, Neil referred to as his producer who helped me to set up this event, as his co-originator um, of the project, Kate Pullinger, who couldn't be with us tonight um, and is a friend of mine, and it's through her that I really got to know about the project. Um, Kate's been to Small Wonder many times. Um, I wanted to thank the audience. Um, I'm delighted to see the younger people here from St. Bede School, uh, to thank our sponsors and to tell you all um, to give one more round of applause to uh, Louisa and Neil. But, but and before that, just to ask you, once you've done that, remain seated while I, I take them out to the bookstall. And um, as I said, Neil's new novel um, will be available there. And um, both of Louise's novels and probably some of their other work as well. So thank you both very much. <laughs>